The S&P 500 as an index as a whole has returned an average of about 12% per year for the last half century. This means that if you just put $100 per month into the S&P 500 for 40 years, you will have $1.2 million 40 years from now if the S&P 500 continues to return 12% on average per year. Hi, this is Ben Hart with another edition of Win Life. Today we're going to talk about the number one habit that's keeping smart people poor. By the way, anyone who follows the advice in my new book, Win Life, is almost sure to be in the top 1% without much trouble. Also, head on over to winlifeinstitute.com to sign up for my free weekly Win Life newsletter. I have all the links to this and more below. Also, I want to see your comments below and hear your ideas. I will answer all questions in the comments section. Now, quick summary of my background before we get started. I've been in the advertising business for more than 30 years, built an ad agency, wrote speeches for America's leading political figures in the 1980s, including Ronald Reagan and George H.W. Bush. My advertising, marketing campaigns, and websites have generated more than $1 billion for my clients over the years. At age 65, I'm also the world's oldest actively competing breakdancer. Now at age 65, I'm no longer really focused on making money. I'm mostly focused now on writing the books that I've wanted to write for years, but just didn't have time to write. And I'm focused on teaching young people who are between the ages of 15 and 30 what I wish I had known when I was that age just getting launched in life. This channel is focused on skills, habits, and routines that you need to succeed in business and in life. We also talk about investing, health, fitness, and critical thinking skills. Today we're going to talk about the number one habit that's keeping very smart people poor. Wealth really has nothing to do with your income or how much money you're bringing in. Wealth is all about how much money you actually keep. I know lawyers who are making a million dollars a year who are poor because they don't save money. They buy expensive cars, they go out to fancy restaurants all the time, and they're shopaholics. 80% of NFL football players are broke two years after leaving the league. 60% of NBA players are broke within five years of leaving the game. NBA great Allen Iverson earned $150 million in salary during his NBA career, plus another $50 million from Reebok and tens of millions of dollars from other endorsement deals. Within a few years of leaving the NBA, Iverson was broke. He loved to spend money. He reportedly kept money in garbage bags around his mansions, much of which went missing. At one point, he reportedly bought a new car because he forgot where he parked his car. His monthly expenses totaled $360,000. Yes, $360,000 per month were his fixed expenses. He reportedly blew $1 million in one night of gambling at an Atlantic City casino. Other sporting greats had similar spending habits and ended up broke, including soccer legend Diego Maradona, golfing great John Daly, heavyweight champion boxer Mike Tyson, NBA Hall of Famer Dennis Rodman, NFL legend Lawrence Taylor, and the list goes on. Boxing great Mike Tyson managed to burn through $685 million in career earnings, reportedly $23 million in debt. To Tyson's credit, he seems to have pulled his life together in his 50s. He's had some roles in movies, he got a TV show, and he put on an HBO hit stand-up performance called Mike Tyson Undisputed Truth, where he just talks about his life. He did this with the help of Spike Lee. Tyson today is estimated to be worth about $10 million, so good for him for coming back. Let's hope he can stay on a budget. It's not what you earn that matters, it's how much you keep and how much you end up with as you get older that matters. If you're not taking at least 10% of your gross income before taxes, before you pay the tax man, and putting that money in a stock market index fund every month, you will almost certainly stay poor and end up poor. I call this paying yourself first. Then you pay the tax man. Then you start paying for other stuff, like your rent, like your electric bill, and food that you need to eat. Good food, healthy food, which actually tends to be the cheaper food. So you need to be socking away 10% of your gross income, before taxes, into a stock market index fund. And if you have to rent one room for $600 a month and live like a hermit to make this happen early in life, well, that's what you're going to have to do. Guess what? 
Life is tough when you're first getting launched into adulthood, in your early 20s. But I promise you, life will get better and pretty quickly if you follow the principles in Win Life and in these podcasts. Now for some good news. Let's just take a quick look at what happens if you put just $100 per month into an S&P 500 stock index fund because of the law of compounding returns. The S&P 500 are the 500 largest companies listed on stock exchanges in the United States. The S&P 500 as an index as a whole has returned an average of about 12% per year for the last half century. This means that if you just put $100 per month into the S&P 500 for 40 years, you will have $1.2 million 40 years from now if the S&P 500 continues to return 12% on average per year. And you will have only put in $48,000 during this period, but that $48,000 that you put in over that 40 years will have turned into $1.2 million. So you will have returned 24 times the money that you put in. This happens because of the miracle of compounding. And you can do the math on this yourself by heading on over to moneychimp.com and using the compound interest calculator there. It's a lot of fun to use. Try it out. Let's learn. Money, money, money in my pocket. Money, money, I know how to count it. Money, money, money in my pocket. Money, money, I know how to count it. The reason the law of compounding returns is so powerful is that you are making 12% per year on average, not just on the money that you put in. You are also making this 12% off the 12% that's building up each year. Now at first, this 12% doesn't sound like much. 12% on $100 is just $12 profit for the year. And 12% on your 12% is just $1.44 extra for the year. So that doesn't sound like much. But this is happening year after year. And you are putting in another $100 in every month. It's like a rolling snowball. At first, when you roll the snowball, the first turn of the snowball, the buildup is, is slow. Not much snow is added to the snowball at first when the snowball is small. As the snowball grows and grows with each roll, the snowball accumulates more and more with each roll. This law of compounding returns is also often called the snowball effect. And this is how Warren Buffett, the famous investor, got rich. He deeply understood the snowball effect. And there's actually a great biography on Warren Buffett titled Snowball. Warren Buffett started with basically zero and is now worth $120 billion. So every time you waste $1 on something stupid, you're actually wasting $24 when you consider the future value of that dollar if you had invested it in an S&P 500 index fund, such as SPY, S-P-Y, or VU, V-O-O. So instead of buying your coffee at Starbucks for $5, make your coffee at home for 25 cents. That $5 Starbucks coffee is really costing you $120 when you consider the time value of money and the law of compounding returns. That's how Warren Buffett thinks about money. Warren Buffett is the most successful investor in history. He started with zero and is now worth about $120 billion. Warren Buffett bought his first house in Omaha, Nebraska for $31,000 in 1958. He still lives in that house today. One day, Warren Buffett was walking in an airport with Catherine Graham, the owner of the Washington Post. I believe this was in the mid-1980s. By this time, Warren was a billionaire. He was also the Washington Post's biggest investor. Catherine Graham needed to make a phone call at a payphone. She didn't have any change. She asked Warren if he had a dime so she could make her phone call. Warren pulled a quarter out of his pocket. He looked at it. He then stepped into a nearby shop to get change for his quarter and handed Catherine Graham a dime for her phone call. And Catherine Graham said something like, Warren, you didn't need to get change for your quarter. I think you could have afforded to give the phone company an extra 15 cents. But that's not how Warren Buffett thinks. Warren Buffett started with zero and became worth $120 billion because he deeply understood the time value of money. His stock market returns averaged 20% per year. That's what makes Warren Buffett the greatest investor of all time. It's very difficult to beat stock market averages. The best investment strategy for 99% of the people out there is just to put $100 or $200 per month or whatever you can afford into a stock market index fund and forget about it. 12% per year of compounded returns over 40 years will become $1.2 million. 
assuming the S&P 500 continues to behave as it has for the past half century. Warren Buffett has been able to get 20% annual compounded returns from his investments in common stocks. So what would $100 per month turn into if you could do this? Well then, that becomes $17 million in 40 years. So this means the future value of $1 is $354 over 40 years for Warren Buffett. That's how he thinks of money. That's why even as a billionaire, he got change for his quarter. He did not want to give 15 cents away to the phone company for no reason. Obviously, he could have just given Catherine Graham the quarter for her phone call instead of the 10 cents she needed. But that's not how his brain works because of the habits of saving he had developed and cultivated over time. It would almost be a violation of his religion to have not gotten change for the quarter and to have wasted that 15 cents. Throwing away money is not something Warren Buffett does, even if it's just 15 cents. Now, even though Warren Buffett is worth $120 billion, his company Berkshire Hathaway only pays him an annual salary of $100,000. His wealth is tied up in the value of the company, and he still lives in the same house he bought in 1958 for $31,000. His life really hasn't changed at all from when he had nothing. Yes, he does fly in a private corporate jet because of the value of his time. Plus, everyone knows who Warren Buffett is, so he can't really just walk through airports. But that's really the only corporate perk he allows himself. Now, very few people really know and will be able to achieve 20% annual compounded returns from the stock market over many decades the way Warren Buffett has. His brain is a computer. His idea of fun is to spend hours and hours studying corporate balance sheets and income statements so he can figure out the best way to invest. Warren Buffett says the best approach for 99% of people is just to take 10% of your gross income and put it into an S&P stock index fund for a 12% annual compounded return on average. The 12% annual returns assume that you automatically reinvest the dividends. Now obviously the 12% return is not automatic every year, it's an average. During the 2008 financial crisis, the S&P 500 dropped 50%. So this can, does, and will happen periodically. Expect it. But if you hold on to your S&P stock index fund over time, and just keep putting money in every month like clockwork, 10% of your gross income before taxes, you will be rich. Assuming we don't have a complete political system collapse and we end up in another dark ages. But short of that, you should be fine. I also like the QQQ. This is the NASDAQ 100 index fund, which is comprised of the 100 biggest companies on the NASDAQ stock exchange. And the NASDAQ stock exchange is weighted more toward technology. Companies like Apple, Google, Microsoft, Tesla, Adobe, and the big semiconductor companies. The NASDAQ 100, ticker symbol QQQ, has generated an average compounded return of 14% per year over the last 20 years. So if you put $100 per month into the QQQ for 40 years, and if it continues to generate 14% annual returns on average instead of 12% from the S&P 500, well then, you'll have $2.2 million in 40 years for your $48,000 that you put into the QQQ, the NASDAQ 100. That means each dollar that you waste is really like wasting $45.83. If you consider the future value of that dollar invested in the QQQ 40 years from now, start thinking of money that way. So the number one habit that will keep you poor is wasting money. And people waste money mostly on little things, not so much big things, but on little things that would not change the quality of your life one bit if you just cut them out. It's really not that hard to make your coffee at home. Look how much time you're wasting standing in line at Starbucks so you can pay $5 for a cup of coffee. That $5 that you're giving Starbucks is really worth $225 in terms of future value of that $5 if you just invested in the QQQ, the top 100 companies on the NASDAQ. Stop wasting money on stupid stuff. One of my employees told me that she would love to follow my advice and invest 10% of her gross income, before taxes, in a stock index fund like the QQQ, or like SPY, but that she would need a raise to be able to do that. I told Lisa that her income was really not the issue, and that a raise would most likely not solve her problem. I told her I was certain that she was throwing away at least 15% of her money on things she didn't need, and that she probably wouldn't notice were missing if she just never bothered to buy these things. No way, she said. I barely have enough income to make ends meet. 
So I made a bet with her. I told her for the next 30 days, every time you spend money, even a penny, write it down in a little pocket notebook, and then enter what you spent that day on an Excel spreadsheet each evening. And I told her, if we can't find 15% of waste in your spending, then I'll give you $1,000. Her annual salary at that time was $45,000. This was in the late 1990s. We sat down, we did some quickie math. I pulled out a yellow legal pad of paper and wrote down some numbers to set a framework for a budget. Lisa was single. Her biggest expense, of course, was taxes, as it is for everyone. Taxes consume 40 cents out of every dollar earned in America. This was Virginia at that time. So taxes we were withholding from her paycheck totaled $9,169 for the year, leaving her a take-home pay of $35,831, or $2,985 per month. So $2,985 per month was Lisa's take-home pay. Lisa agreed to the bet. If I could not find 15% of waste in her spending, I would owe her $1,000 and give her a pay raise. And she carried out her end of the bet. She wrote down every expense in a pocket-sized notebook, even if the expense was 10 cents. She also agreed to keep her receipts from all trips to the grocery store, pharmacy, and other stores, as well as to show me her credit card statements and bank statements. One month later, she presented her log of expenses. Lisa was paying $1,100 per month for rent and $195 per month on utilities to include electricity and water. She was paying $135 per month for cable and internet and $85 per month for her mobile phone plan. So Lisa had $1,515 per month in fixed expenses. She also had to eat, so had to buy groceries. We'd budget $250 per month for groceries. Lisa was spending $325 per month on car costs to include car payment, auto insurance, and gas. This left Lisa $895 per month for other things, discretionary spending. What was she spending this on? Well, a quick scan of her expenses for the month showed she was spending $7 every day at Starbucks for coffee and yogurt. That's $210 for the month right there. Lisa was also spending $65 taking the tollway to work each day. For an extra five minutes driving on non-toll roads each day, that's money that could be going into her pocket instead of the tollway. She had spent $475 that month going out with her friends to bars and restaurants. She had spent $355 going to the mall shopping. She was buying clothes, shoes, makeup, and eating at the food court. She had $6,400 in credit card debt and was paying a 26% interest rate on that debt which totaled $138 for the month. So she was spending $1,233 per month on things she didn't need, which was actually 50% more than the $895 in discretionary funds she had each month. More alarming was the 26% interest rate she was paying on her $6,400 in credit card debt. I told her she would never dig her way out of debt even if I gave her a 10% raise unless she changes her spending habits. Instead of paying $138 per month to service the 26% interest on her credit card debt, she could be putting that money into the QQQ NASDAQ 100 index fund and getting rich over time. I'm so embarrassed, she said. I had no idea I was spending that much, and I have no idea how I'm going to dig myself out of this debt I'm in. She put her face into her hands. And I said, you know, this is very solvable. Let's sit down and put together a budget. The first item that we had to deal with was the $6,400 in credit card debt that she had racked up with her trips to the mall, restaurants, and bars. The first thing we need to do, I told her, was limit your spending to $250 per month on entertainment and $100 per month on clothing and makeup. And then I went on. You will pay cash for everything. You will not use your credit card for anything. You will put $250 in cash into an envelope and mark that envelope, Entertainment. $100 per month will go into another envelope. You'll mark that envelope, Clothing and Makeup. Once your cash is gone from each of these envelopes, you're done for the month. No more spending on these items. Also, no more Starbucks. Start making your own coffee at home. Put it in a thermos. Start shopping at Ross and Dollar Store. You must set aside $138 for credit card interest. That leaves you $545 per month to pay off your credit card debt. This will take you 12 months. 
you will essentially have to live in a debtor's prison, your apartment, until you pay off your credit card debt. Lisa started to cry. Then I said, I will make a deal with you. If you stick to this program for 12 months and pay off your credit card debt, plus sign an agreement that you will never pay credit card interest again in your life, I will raise your pay by $5,000. Lisa agreed. She promised she would do this. Eight months later, she came to me and said, I'm done. I've paid off my $6,400 in credit card debt. Wow, I said. How did you do that? I followed exactly the program we agreed to. Plus, I got out of my $1,100 apartment lease and moved to a townhouse with two roommates. This cut my rent $600 per month. I got rid of my car because the townhouse was near a train station. So I take a train to work now. Subtracting the cost of the car while adding the cost of the train nets me about $150 per month. We share utility and cable costs. I was able to cut my cell phone plan from $85 to $55 per month. I was careful at the grocery store. Only bought healthy foods with no extras. No magazines, no junk food, no wine. I was able to cut my monthly grocery bill from $250 to $175. And I was still able to go out once a week with friends. Lisa added, I actually did as you said. I treated saving money like a game. A battle with myself that I was determined to win. I told my friends what I was doing. Now they're all following the program. We meet once a week to discuss our progress. Not at a restaurant, at one of our places. We have to show the group what we spent money on that week. We now have 15 people in our group doing this, and we're having a lot of fun doing it. By following this program, Lisa was able to sock away $200 every paycheck, every two weeks, and put that money into her 401k, into the QQQ NASDAQ 100 Stock Index Fund. If the QQQ returns an average of 12% per year, this will be $5.2 million in 40 years. If the QQQ returns 14% per year on average, as it's been doing for the past 20 years, she'll have $9.7 million in 40 years. Now also, make sure you put this money in a 401k or an IRA retirement plan, because the money you put in is tax-free until you start taking it out for retirement. This means you are actually getting a 25% to 50% return on your money the first year, because you're not paying taxes on it depending on what your tax bracket is, in addition to whatever you might be getting from stock market appreciation. But my experience over the years is that less than 10% of employees actually take advantage of putting money into a 401k retirement plan. Even employees making $200,000 a year, they just don't save for retirement. They are putting $0 from their paycheck into a 401k even though it's available, where they could be investing into an S&P 500 index or a NASDAQ 100 index, and using pre-tax money to do so. That's how people who are earning $200,000 per year stay poor. Because accumulating wealth has nothing to do with how much money you're making. It's all about how much money you're keeping. With each paycheck, with each dollar you bring in, make a commitment to set aside 10% of your gross pay before taxes for your retirement fund. Everyone can do this. If you're only earning $35,000 per year, you can do this. This would mean you would be setting aside $291 per month to invest in a S&P 500 index fund like SPY or the QQQ. That's if you're earning $35,000 per year. And that means you'll have $3.4 million in 40 years, assuming a 12% average annual return on your money from a stock market index fund like SPY or QQQ. But your income should also be going up over time, right? Hopefully you won't be making $35,000 per year for the rest of your life, especially if you keep listening to my podcast and if you read my book, Win Life. If you follow even some of the advice in this book, you should have no trouble being in the top 1% of income earners. So check out my book, Win Life. You'll find it on Amazon in all the formats, print, Kindle ebook, and audiobook. If you like this content and want to see more, please hit the like, subscribe, and notifications button. Get my free Win Life newsletter by heading over to winlifeinstitute.com. It's free, comes out once a week. And leave any comments and questions you have below. I do read the comments and I will answer your questions. And check out the links to the success resources that I've included below. Thank you for listening. 
Hope to see you back here for the next edition of Win Life.